So what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I, th I thought it's, it's, a, it's a good topic for a third talk. First of all, it's going to be completely self-contained and not related to the, my first two talks. And it's a good topic in the sense that while it, it's a, a certain very general problem that occurs in many areas of mathematics, in, actually, we, those of you who were in my previous talks, it occurred, we just didn't notice and, uh, that uh, we were studying the type of problem that I'm going to discuss today. So it occurs in many areas of mathematics. There are some theorems which are, involve interesting methods and ideas, and they're maybe complicated, and, but generally it's one big open problem. So um, essentially, I, I hope every, every two minutes I'm going to mention a major open problem, and there is really a lot to do in this area. And the, and the topic is nonlinear spectral gaps or metric spectral gaps. But I'll start by motivating it in a, in, in a way which is um, actually historically unfair. So I'm going to start with the end versus how this originally initially arose. But, uh, but still, I think it's a nice picturesque way to explain what's going on. So what is an expander graph? Or a, an expander graph sequence? So it's a sequence of graphs, let's say gn. And let's say, just for simplicity, simplicity the vertex set are just the numbers 1 to n. And there is some set edge, uh, some uh, set of edges. And let's say they're three regular. So um, every vertex has three neighbors in the graph. And the def classical definition of expansion is that, um, so if I take, um, uh, if I take the minimum over all subsets of the numbers 1 to n with at most n over 2 uh, uh, vertices, and I'll look at the number of edges joining or leaving s, divided by the size of s, so this is an isoperimetric problem, this minimum or, uh, and the infimum of this over all n. So there is some positive constant independent of the size of the graph, such that for every subset S uh, with at most half the vertices, the proportion of edges leaving it is a constant, is at least that constant independent of n. So this is what this means that this is positive. So this is the classical definition of expander. But here is an equivalent geometric definition. The equivalence is very easy, what I'm going to show now. This is not a, a deep fact. Um, so I guess geometric, geometric definition or equivalent formulation. And it says the following. Uh, so for every n vectors, let's say x1 up to xn, in some Euclidean space, some rk, let's say this room, r3. Or, um, so for every n vectors in rk, if I look at the average of um, their distances, that's up to a universal constant independent of n, the average over the same distances, but only, and I, 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 I can even say for every p. Uh, so if I look at the average p power of the distances between all the n squared n choose 2 pairs, that's up to a universal constant, a function of this constant here. Um, the same as averaging over edges. Notice that here I have roughly n squared numbers. I have, well, I have roughly f n squared numbers, and here, because it's a three regular graph, I have order n numbers. So, the, uh, so in the first definition, there is no distance. There is no distance. I'm telling you this is going to be equivalent. I'll explain the equivalence. It's a, I agree, a priori there is no distance. But let's first understand I, what I like about this is this is the kind of thing you can explain 
to non-mathematicians and they're kind of amazed. So what is this telling us? Okay, so let's, let's say k is three and we're sitting in this room and the xi's are, are us, okay? And I wanna know what is the average distance between the people sitting up here, around here. So I can compute all the pairwise distances, that's gonna be maybe 500 numbers, and I can average them, that's perfectly fine. Now, um, what, what, what the other thing I can do here is I can decide to put this graph structure, so uh, on us, we're sitting in this room, so let's say I can look at, uh, and, and I can average the following numbers, so I can, let's say I can look at Sergio, Dave, Noga and Sophie, okay? And, I, and, I, and I'm gonna look at the distance between Sergio and Dave, Sergio and Sophie, Sergio and Noga, and, and the same for everybody, for their numbers, average these numbers, and I'm gonna get the same answer. But I know that you guys don't wanna make life easier for me, so you will hear that that's what I'm doing, then you are gonna start shuffling around, okay? So Sergio is gonna move up there and Dave is gonna go somewhere else, and I say, I don't care. I'm still measuring those distances, averaging all these numbers, and I will get the average distance. So you say, okay, fine, uh, let's make it even harder. And you know, Halloween is coming up and Sergio has a perfect Noga costume. Okay, so you dress, you don't only move around, but you get dressed as Noga and, and, and everybody else has costumes of everybody else. So you also change your identities, okay, and, and move around the room. So I can't tell the costume, the costume is perfect. So I just still uh, measure the distance from uh, let's say Noga, which is actually Sergio, Eden is Noga, to his, to his neighbors, what I had before, and I will still get the correct answer. So I don't care about your identities, I don't care about your locations, I just measure, instead of 500 numbers, much less numbers, and I will always get the correct answer. No matter which massive cloud of points sits in this room, this will always work. So this is an expander, okay, this is the notion of expansion. Is this clear to everybody? And I think this is not intuitive that such a thing exists. I mean, we, we know that expanders are non-intuitive statements. My experience is, is that, at least to non-mathematicians, this is kind of shocking that such a sequence of graphs exist. That there is a way to play this game. So this, is, this uh, interpretation of expansion is what's called a universal distance or average distance approximator. And this thing uh, started with the work on in, of Indic in 99 and, and well, in using expanders for these purposes by Barhum, Goldreich, and Schreibman, I think in 07. And it, this is exactly what the, an expander does. It's, it's a scheme. So choosing only linearly many numbers, not n squared, but constant times n numbers, such that whenever you give me a cloud of points in some high dimensional Euclidean space or any dimensional Euclidean space, you want to know the average, the answer is average only linearly many, not as many. And this is, uh, computer scientists are interested in this because this is what's called the sublinear algorithm. So the input data is all the pairwise distances. It's size n squared, but we're outputting a number which is, while well, doing only n, computation of length n, which is less than the size of the input, but we're getting uh, the answer up to a constant. So this is what an expander is. The equivalence between this and this, so p equals one is just the definition. So I have to think about it, but uh, this is just playing with the definition. p equals two, for those of you who know, this is the spectral characterization, spectral formulation. of expansion. So by that I mean, you look at the adjacency matrix of the graph, it has a spectral gap, and this is the same as this inequality for p equal two. The equivalence between p, one and p equals one and p equals two is what we call Chigurh's inequality. Okay, and, and, and just because I don't want to discuss p's, from now on I'm gonna focus on p equals two, I'm gonna write all the inequalities with p equal two because that's the simplest, but um, but this is what an expander means. So th this is a very important classical notion from graph theory. It has the fo that geometric meaning. Now once you write it this way, there is a completely obvious question that you want to ask, at least to me, but to many people, which is, so I think this is really an obvious question.
So what is the role of Euclidean space here? Okay, so this game that we're playing, we were, you're giving me a cloud of points and you're asking what is the average distance, there can be points in some manifold or maybe on some other norm or in some graph or in a, inside a group. Maybe we can do these things in, other, what, what, so, what, what was the role of Euclidean space in this context? Okay, so, and this is where we come to the notion of expanders with respect to metric spaces. So as formulated, this is due to Gromov who popularized this, but we will see that uh, we were studying this actually last week uh, without even knowing. Okay, so, but, um, so let's say, uh, uh, so let XD be a metric space now. Um, so uh, say that a sequence of three regular graphs gn as before so the vertices and the numbers one to n and there is some edges so this was um, is an expander with respect to the geometry x If if for every n points in my metric space, the same thing holds. If I look at the average over all possible pairs of distances, the distance from xi to xj squared, that's up to a universal constant independent of n the average over some of those ij which happen to form an edge of the distance from xi to xj squared. So, and you can ask, um, given a metric space, can you find expanders with respect to it? The minute you do, you solve this sublinear approximation problem, right? You, you are able to compute distances while not looking at all the n squared distances, a averages of distances. So let me make a few comments before we actually see the bigger picture here. So the first comment, I have a few that I need to make. Let me just make sure that I do not forget. Yeah, okay, so first of all, in this inequality here, one direction is always trivial. So, so this is an easy exercise that for every metric space x and for every regular graph uh, g again the vertices are 1 to n one uh, the the fact that this is bigger than this always holds this is just a playing around with the triangle inequality so it's always true that the sum the average over edges is at most a constant like four or 10, some small constant um, times the, t the average over everything. Okay, so this is always true. So the notion of expansion is about this being smaller than that, because this is always true. Okay, so, so the real issue, I'll keep this definition. Uh, so the real issue is to get an inequality of the form is at most So this is an easy exercise up there from the triangle inequality. The other comment that I want to make is that unless everything is trivial, so unless 
x is just a, is just a singleton, being an expander, so in any, any metric system that has at least two points, being an expander uh, with respect to x implies being an expander uh, with respect in the classical sense, the, in the combinatorial sense. If it contains at least two points, why? This, has, this inequality here has to all hold for all points in the metric space. Now, if the metric space contains at least two points, A and B, you can let Xi just range among A and B. So what are all the possible choices of Xi among A and B? It's, it's essentially like partitioning the graph into two pieces. Those i's which were mapped to A, so for which Xi equals A, those i's for which x i's equals b, and then when you write down what this means, it becomes this. It becomes this. Okay, so the, the, what's coming, where it's written here, is, it's exactly different when you're counting only the distance, the, the, the edges that go from those that are labeled a to those that are labeled b. Okay, so this is, this is the minute there are two points, uh, you imp this implies expansion, so whenever I'm gonna be constructing an expander for you, in particular, I'm constructing a classical expander. This is genuinely, and we'll see strictly, a more, actually a vastly more general notion than expansion, a stronger notion. In no metric space, if, for, if you somehow manage to come up with an expander with respect to anything, it's gonna be a classical expander in the sense of spectrum or whatever. Okay, so that's, a, that's one comment. Um, Second comment, a third, I guess, is that no graph is an expander, or no graph sequence is an expander with respect to itself. What do I mean by that? Look at the inequality that I'm searching for, which is this one here. And suppose that D is actually the shortest path metric on the very same graph. Is that clear? That's what I mean by, so I claim that this cannot hold with a constant here. Why is that? Let's think for a moment. Uh, okay, and, and then we take Xi equals, so suppose that D is the shortest path metric, the geodesic metric on the, the vertices. Uh, induced by the graph, and take xi equals i. So just I just take all the vertices in the graph. So just saying, so what's written here? The distance in the graph between i and j, but when i and j is an edge, so this is one, so this is an average of ones, right? Now what's going on here? Here uh, you have the distance from i to j, and you average it over all the pairs. But the graph is three re regular, so um, so the graph is three regular. So this is a standard computation. You look at vertex i, and so how many neighbors does it have? It has three. These further guys also have three neighbors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In a ball of radius uh, r, the total number of points here is at most three to the r. This is, it grows by a factor of three at each time at most, right? So, hmm? two to the r, but that, this is correct. Okay, um, and uh, and um, and so so if r is less than a small enough constant, one over ten log n n is the total number of vertices, the number of points in outside this ball is at least half the graph, right? 
So for every vertex in the graph, at least half of the points are a distance at least log n, constant times log n away from it, by this little counting argument. So now if you look at this average, so for fix i, the number of j's for which you see here log n written is at least a constant fraction of the n's. So whole, all this thing here is going to, so the, I guess for you, the right hand side is going to be at least log n squared, right? So nothing is an expander with respect to itself, but we do know that there exists classical expanders. So expanders are sometimes are sometimes. So we, we de definitely see this is a strictly strict generalization. It's not obvious that expanders exist with respect to a metric space. So it's three. So okay. So four is an, an obvious uh, uh, consequence. So for, so nice spaces. Let's say L infinity does not admit. expanders, right? Because every metric space is isometric to infinity, and nothing is an expander with respect to itself. So in particular, a nice Banach space, you cannot come up with an expander. So even though classical expanders exist, you cannot come up always. You, you have to get, it's not always true that expanders exist. You can even say a bit more. So this is an observation important observation of Gromov. So Gromov, so if Gn, the sequence of three regular graphs, is an expander with respect to a metric space, then um, then uh, G, so Gn do not embed Gn with the shortest path metric on Gn. So let's call DGn. Gn DG is just the shortest path metric induced by the graph. These metric spaces do not embed coarsely into X. So what is a coarse embedding? So a coarse embedding, so coarse embedding is the following. So you have two metric spaces, x, d, x, and maybe I'll just give them different names. So let's say y, d, y, and z, d, z. So, and then we say that y embeds coarsely into x, into z, if you can find the mapping f from y into z, and then it's such that in the image, the distance between any two points, so this is in the image, is at least some function of the distance between uh, the points in y, and at most some other function. Um, and the only thing that you require is that alpha of t goes to infinity as t goes to, in, goes to infinity as t goes to infinity. So a coarse embedding is a very weak requirement. You want to map the points in your metric space y, so this is y. You want to put them somehow in x in such a way that in the image you don't want anything other than to say that when distances in y become arbitrarily large, the same should happen in the image. Okay, so large distances map to large distances, but this can be log, 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 and some other function, I don't care, okay? And what I'm claiming, or Gromov is, claims, that if you are an expander, then you cannot embed your sequence of metric spaces into x with this moduli alpha and beta independent of n. Why is that? So let's see what I'll show you exactly. Well, what I mean is that you can, you, there, there do not exist for every n a mapping fn from gn into x, such that this holds, and, but alpha and beta are independent of n. OK, that's it. Now, this is what essentially the computation that we already did. 
because suppose you could map gn into x, then obviously, um, let's just apply the definition. So it's up there. So, so I look at, in x, the distance from fi and fj squared. And I want this to be, at, well, I know that this is true. The distance from, in x from fi, fj squared. But now this is over edges only. OK? And I'll use the only thing. So suppose that this, this f satisfies this condition. So all of these numbers, uh, uh, so the distance in x from fi to fj is at most, so I get that at most, the average ij and edge, whatever the modulus is, the upper bound, beta, times the distance in gn from i to j, right? Because that's the only thing I know, that the, in the image, the distance between points is most beta times the original distance. But all these numbers are 1. So this is some constant, beta of 1 squared. And for the very same reason that we did before, this is at least 1 over n squared alpha dfi of j. And we know what we just computed is that a constant fraction of these numbers here are, log, are at least a constant times log n. So this is at least alpha of some constant times log n squared. And there you see the alpha is not going to infinity. OK? So coarse embeddings are a very weak notion of embedding, but they are also very useful in geometric measure theory. But when you want to find an invariant which rules out coarse embeddability, so if you want to rule out something very weak, that's a hard thing to do. What, and and we, I actually know of three invariants for four invariants for coarse embedding. So this is one of the methods. The other method was on, in Thursday's, in Friday's talk was metric cotype. So that was another invariant, and there's one or two more. So it's really not easy to rule out coarse embeddability. And this is one of them. And, and it's very simple. So the way you should think of exp the relation of being an expander with respect to some geometry is that the geometry on the graph is in many senses orthogonal to the geometry of, the, of x. So there is no way to put these graphs gn into x in any meaningful way, with any modulus. It's not going to happen. You're never going to get the lower bound to go to infinity. Large distances will never go to infinity in the image. Okay, so they are very, they're, they're very, very different from x. Okay, that's what an expander means. Okay, so these are the comments that I want to make. And of course, the obvious questions are, do they exist? Um, so maybe I should just say there is a, a, the bigger picture that I should mention is really about nonlinear spectral gaps. So the setting is, if you have A, which is AIJ, is going to be an n by n symmetric stochastic matrix. Then, and I have some abstract set x, and I have a function k from x to x, a two variable function, um, which is symmetric in, in its variables. So such a function we'll just call, k is called a kernel. And then we can define um, the spectral gap of A with respect to the kernel k is defined to be, is, so it's denoted gamma of A with respect to k, it's defined to be the smallest gamma such that, um, uh, so such that if you give me n points in my abstract set and you look at the average over k x i x j over all i j, 
that's at most gamma over n um, aij, kxijxj. Okay, so that's the notion of the spectral gap of a matrix with respect to a kernel. Okay, and the case that we were looking at before was when A was an adjacency matrix, so A was one over the degree or one over three if I is a neighbor of J and zero otherwise. Okay, that was the case that we were looking at before. And K was a, a metric squared on some metric space. Now, I don't claim for a moment that I care about general K. You should think only about the geometric setting in this talk. The reason it's worthwhile to go to these extremes is uh, that it actually, all of a sudden, you discover theorems. There are amazingly more, more, more things that you can say about this very abstract setting than you would expect, and it actually helps us to discover facts about metrics as well. So this is the notion of a spectral gap with respect to a kernel. And the, why we call it a spectral gap is exactly that if, if lambda 1, a is symmetric stochastic. So I, look, I write the eigenvalues of a in decreasing order. Then in the case kxy is the distance in r between x to y squared, so that's just x minus y squared, just the standard Euclidean kernel. In this case, gamma of a with respect to, as I said, the r squared is 1 minus 1 minus lambda 2. 1 over 1 minus lambda 2 of a. So this is an exercise in linear algebra. Expand the squares and check. Okay, so in the special case when you look at Euclidean geometry, then the best constant you can put here is the classical gap 1 over the gap in the spectrum, which we always, that's what we always do when we look at expanders classically. And now you can define a spectral gap of a matrix with respect to a geometry, let's say a manifold or a norm space. And we already saw that this is a priori has, has nothing to do with the original notion of spectral gap. And uh, I'll give you a taste of this, but one of the things that we're discovering over the years is that this generalization actually has more structure than you would expect. So things like spectral calculus, et cetera, can, be made to make, can make sense for spectral gaps with respect to certain metric spaces. Yes. A, in the case of a graph, in, in the case of the graph, that was the same definition when you take the symmetric stochastic matrix to be the normalized adjacency matrix of the graph. AIJ, you mean? Oh, Sorry, my, no, that, that's what you mean. The, the IJ entry is, yeah. So. Um, so we saw that there are metric spaces that do not admit any expander. So um, here is a quite, uh, there was a, was a question from early, to, from 2003, I think, of Kasparov. You, it's a question. So um, uh, does there exist a sequence of, let's say, three regular graphs, Gn, that are expanders with respect to every. So I want to write here norm space. But we saw that's impossible. L infinity doesn't allow expanders. So every so you need some sort of restriction as geometry, let's say uniformly convex. Norm space, so let me remind you what the definition of uniform convexity is. So uniform convexity. Um, is that 
So you draw the unit ball. So this is the set of all the points x in x of norm at most 1. And, um, and uniform, so th this is a convex set. So if you take two points x and y on the boundary, so the unit vectors, and you look at their midpoint, then it's somewhere inside the ball. That's just the definition of convexity. Uniform convexity says that if this distance is epsilon, then this distance here, the amount it went inside, is at least delta depending on epsilon, but not on the pair of points. Okay, so if your two points are far apart, then their midpoint went inside the ball by at least some delta, which is only the function of their distance. So in Hilbert space, for example, it, uh, delta of epsilon behaves like epsilon squared. That's an easy exercise, Pythagoras theorem. Okay, so, um, so this is uniform convexity, and this is what this would rule out L infinity. And they asked, can you uh, find a sequence of graphs which are simultaneously expanders with respect to every uniformly convex uh, Banach space? Okay. Now they were hoping that the answer is no, for their application, but the answer is yes. Oh, and yeah. I should say that in the literature we call such graphs, so such graphs are called super expanders. Okay, so the super doesn't refer to the fact that they're better than expanders. They are stronger than expanders, but, but uniformly convex spaces are in the Banach space literature, they're called super reflexive spaces. So that's where the word super comes from. So in 209, Laforg, Van San Laforg, proved that super expanders exist. And specifically, he said that if you look at a finite quotient, of a uh, co-compact lattice in, in SL3 QP, the periodic rationals, a sequence of finite quotients with bigger and bigger index will form a super expander. Okay? But he needs the periodics uh, for this. That's a beautiful theorem. His proof is absolutely beautiful. It's geometry and it's representation theory and it's really nice piece of work. But just so you see an example of the many open questions, so open, the following question is open. And that was actually, I, I not written, but I heard from several people that it was asked earlier by, Mar by Margulis, is, is the same true for finite quotients of SL3Z. So do we need to go to the periodics? His, his proof really uses it. Okay, so this, is a, this proof uses it, and we simply do not know. Very concrete group. You look at finite quotients of it. You look at the Cayley graphs. Are they super expanders or not? And just to show you the level of open questions, um, I'll, I'll explain to you right now. I'll construct for you now a different construction of super expanders. But other than these two constructions, Nothing else is known. So any classical theory, a, example of expanders, whatever, there is this huge industry of constructing expanders, Ramanujan graphs, random graphs, anything. We, do not, we simply do not know how to prove, wh to decide whether they're super expanders or not. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. I'll, I'll, I will show you. I believe that, let's say, random graphs are not super expanders. And I will state a theorem, a recent theorem that Mendel and I proved that, in my opinion, indicated that that's the case or suggests. But Ramanujan graphs, uh, any, your favorite construction, prove, the, prove, decide yes or no, are they super expanders? We simply do not know. Okay? I, I will show you today, so this is due to Mendel and myself, from 2010. I will do just a, a, a hands-on, like an iterative construction. of super expanders. Um, 
Um, and, it, and it has all kinds of additional properties that I will say. So by iterative, I mean I'll just start with a small graph and I'll just build it inductively, bigger, bigger graphs, and they will have this, this super expansion property. Okay? There will be expanders simultaneously with, for every, with respect to every uniformly convex geometry, and not only norm spaces, many more things we will see. Okay, so, so really I would, uh, I would uh, love for, for the existence of more methods. So Laforgue's proof is a tour de force in representation theory. What I will sh our construction uses a lot of analysis, a lot of Fourier analysis, and, um, and, and, and some combinatorial tools, but to decide whether a random graph has this property, or maybe let me just tell you another one of the main questions that's actually extremely important related to the question of uh, classical constructions, uh, uh, does there exist a super expander GN um, with girth at least a constant times log of its size? So that's, girth means the length of the shortest cycle. Logarithmic girth is the best you can hope for. Lots of classical graphs, like Ramanujan graphs, have this property. Our constructions, both in the quotients of co-compact lattices in SL3QP and the one I'm gonna to explain to you now, do not have this property. And I should say that we need them. So once, if somebody comes up with uh, such a sequence of graphs, we can fit them in as essentially as a black box into Gromov's random group construction and construct a group which has fixed point properties that we've never seen before. And it will have a, it's a, something that we've been hunting uh, for a long time and we simply do not know if these guys exist. Maybe having large girth means that you cannot be in a super expander. I have no idea what to believe. So, yeah. You need log for you need log for the application I have in mind, but I'd be very happy for anything going to infinity because none of our examples have this property. I would be happy for any new construction of anything that, uh, that looks different from what exists. Uh, these are, we're actually, we're really fighting hard to construct these guys. And, um, but for the application I hinted at, I really need logarithmic earth. Okay, so, um, but anything would be interesting. Anything new would be interesting. Of course, this is related to the question on random graphs, etc. Um, so let me tell you very, really, I, 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 I do not have time. This is, this is a substantial construction. Let me just tell you what the idea is. So, um, so we start with, a, with, a way, uh, with the famous construction called the zigzag product. So this is... And this is a way to start with, your, 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 you take two graphs and you combine, you combine, combine them to get a bigger graph. So let's say one of them has N1, G1 has N1 vertices and degree D1, and G2 has a D1 vertices and degree some number, D2. And I will get a graph called the zigzag product, um, which has n1 times d1 vertices and degree d2. It's, so I will not give the formal definition with indices. Uh, let me draw you a picture. So for example, if g1 is the tetrahedron, So it's, this is G1, so the degree is three, and G2 is a triangle. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chop off the corners of the tetrahedron. I'm gonna get something like Okay, is that clear? I'm just chopping off the corners. And I need to tell you what are the edges. So this is a graph with the correct number of vertices. Now we multiplied the, the, the previous number of vertices by three. 
and, uh, and to explain to you what the, I need to say what the edges are, so st start with the vertex, go to one of its neighbors in G2, so let's say go here, jump to the neighbor in the tetrahedron, and then choose one of its neighbors, let's say this one, in the little triangle here, and this will be the new edge of the zigzag product. And I look at all the possibilities. We start from one, going to a neighbor in the triangle, jumping in the tetrahedron, and one of the other two neighbors. Did I write D2? Did I not? I intended to write D2 squared. OK? So the, and you can give a formula for this. I just don't have time. This is, this is the construction. It's a way to take two graphs and make a bigger graph. Now, it's good I have this definition with kernels. So. <laughs> So in, in, a, in their famous paper, Rheingold, Vedan, and Wiglerson showed that if you start with two graphs which have a spectral gap, in the classical sense, their zigzag product also has a, has a spectral gap and there is an inequality. Actually, we don't even care for the construction of what the inequality is. So that was a nice fact in linear algebra. Um, the, our starting point was a, the following fact, the realization that that this is absolutely more general, so it's for every kernel. If I look at the Poincaré constant of G1 zigzag G2, any kernel, that's at most the Poincaré constant of G1 times the Poincaré constant of G2 squared. So in the linear world, this would be 1 minus 1 over lambda g1 zigzag g2 is at most 1 over 1 minus lambda of g1 times 1 minus 1 over lambda g2 squared. That would be, this is the second largest eigenvalue. And if you simplify it, you get the inequ an inequality of the spirit that, uh, of what Rheingold, Vedan, and Wigderson proved using linear algebra, but this has nothing to do with linear algebra. This is, this is, if you write it like this, then this is just sub-multiplicativity. So it's, a, it's just playing around with the definition, nothing more, okay? But this immediately shows you that uh, you understand what happens to this construction under, um, under a, a, for, for arbitrary kernels. So now let me give you a massively simplified version of the construction. It's, I'm going to be hiding a lot of things that have to be taken care of. But um, so maybe let's call it a theorem. So, or, so let's make an assumption. So, so, so assumption on the metric space. which for a reason that I will make clear is, I call it a nonlinear spectral calculus. And it's as follows, it says that for every matrix A, if you look at, a, you look at the Cesaro average, okay, so, I take a, uh, a symmetric stochastic matrix A. This is a new symmetric stochastic matrix. And I look at the constant that I get in the inequality. That's at most K times the max um, of a 1 and gamma of A over M. So, and this has to happen for every matrix A. We'll see in a second where this is coming from. But the theorem is Ah, huh? oh, that's horrible. C. 
see some constant depending on the kernel. And uh, well, I, I call it the distance. So it wasn't, I wasn't using k twice in this inequality, I think, but OK. Um, So, the, so once you do this, then if you start with a, a graph H and you inductively define uh, um, GI plus 1 to be 1 over M sum Okay, so what, what, what does this mean? Okay, so I, I identify a graph with this adjacency matrix. So, so, by the, so this is what I'm doing to the adjacency matrix. So this is the same as taking, uh, taking two vertices in the, so f first check, taking a number uh, from, one to, uh, from zero to n minus one uniformly at random. Once you have this number, you, for, uh, for every vertex x and every walk of length that number t, you, wherever it ends, you add an edge joining them. Okay, so this is, what this does, you zigzag it with h, so you, there is an issue of showing that this is allowed to do, and I will ignore this. If you do this, then this will be then a gamma of gi is at most, I think we get k times gamma of h, gamma of g. Squared, okay, provided M is large enough, so it will be the largeness of it will depend on this number C here, and this is an easy induction. So once you have the inequality up here, just prove this by induction. Okay, just check that you just plug in this and this assumption, and you will see that it works. Okay, so this is a good way to get bigger and bigger and bigger graphs, but notice that the constant in the Poincaré inequality remains constant. K, no, no, well, C. Is it clear? I, I, it's a very easy induction. I would have shown it at a time. There is nothing more than writing the induction down, OK? So this is a very simple way to get bigger and bigger graphs uh, that are expanders with respect to a metric space. Now, why did, so, but there is this key assumption in the geometry, which is spectral calculus. So I can use this. Why did we even call it spectral calculus? So let's look what happens in the real line. So what can I say about gamma of 1 over m a to the t um, with respect to the standard metric on the real line? So that's, we know that's 1 minus 1 over lambda the second largest eigenvalue of a, of, not, uh, of this average. Right? Which is what? Which is 1 over 1 minus lambda of a, a sum, sorry, sum a 1 over m, we have a geometric sum, lambda of a. Here I'm using spectral calculus, right? And I can write this down as a geometric sum and express it in terms of lambda. Okay, this is just, there is some formula. And when you do it, you get this behavior. Okay, so in the, class, in the usual spectral interpretation, you know exactly what happens to Chisaro averages. You, the constant is one over one, something which is an algebraic interpretation. This algebraic interpretation allows us to relate it to just a parameter of the matrix A itself. And now there is just a computation or playing around with inequalities and you see that this is what happens. So in the Euclidean world, what happens is when you take a matrix and you uh, raise it to a big power, or take a, this is a smoother version because we need it. Um, when you raise it to a big power, what it does to the Poincaré constant is that it makes it smaller by a factor of that power as long as you're allowed. It cannot be smaller than one. Okay, so this is why this is spectral calculus, and we need this assumption for this strategy to work. Okay? Now, it turns out that this is a subtle assumption. There are 
So we know that not all spaces satisfy spectral calculus, nonlinear spectral calculus. Um, so, um, so these are interesting constructions. They, even not, they don't satisfy in a very, very bad way. So you cannot put any function going to infinity with m here. So you can get really, so even, so this is a, another difference between the linear world and the nonlinear world. For a general metric space, you do not have this algebraic interpretation of the best constant of the inequality. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But, and this, but, but we proved that uniformly, so uniformly convex spaces do satisfy this, inequ this inequality up there, spectral nonlinear spectral calculus. So you can carry out this construction. And that is a fun question in geometry. So, so this constant gamma was defined as the smallest constant in a certain inequality. Okay? Why do we know that it satisfies what we want in the Euclidean world? We know it because it is an, an algebraic interpretation. And this algebraic interpretation tells you exactly what iterating this Markov uh, relates uh, shows you how to relate what happens after t steps of the Markov chain to step one, but this is algebraically. So in order to prove this theorem here, you need to do something new even in Hilbert space. So assume, suppose I told you prove this inequality in Hilbert space, but nowhere in the proof you're allowed to say the word eigenvalue or eigenvector. You're only allowed to use geometry. Okay? So it's possible to do this, and this is what we were looking for. And, um, and what turns out is that the type of geometry that's needed is uniform convexity, or actually you need non-positive curvature in a, certain, in a certain sense. So this becomes a, a theorem, a, a nice inequality about martingales. And we need that martingale, you need to wait A to be able to define martingales in the, in the metric space, and B, um, and B to a, uh, to prove certain inequalities about them. So this becomes a nice question in analysis. It's not always true, and the question which metric spaces satisfy spectral calculus is a very important one, and I do not know the answer. But we know certain classes using a new method that we introduced, Martingale methods. Uh, we know how to prove this assumption, therefore to carry out this type of construction. Okay, so I'll end with... Um, with a more recent uh, theorem, so um, so these graphs G N that you construct using the zigzag construction have the following. So this is so they have all kinds of properties for which I actually do not know how to use the representation theory approach of Laforgue. This really becomes a problem in analysis or geometry that is, uh, uh, I think, is interesting. So, so let Gn be the graphs above. So Gn, the expanders. They're very concrete graphs uh, constructed above. Then they have the following curious property. Then Gn are expanders with respect to random graphs. I guess D regular. What do I mean by that? So I mean that if H is an n vertex, the regular graph chosen uniformly at random from all such graphs. Okay. 
then the probability over this age that um, I look at gamma of my specific, these are deterministic concrete graphs that I constructed with respect to the metric induced by H. So this is the shortest path metric. The probability that, uh, um, that this, uh, uh, that this that for every n, this is at most 100, some constant, I'm not sure that maybe, let's put 10,000, this probability tends to, to 1 as n goes to infinity. Sorry, uh, h, I don't want it to be n vertex, m vertex. So these graphs are, in a sense, orthogonal to random graphs. So this is a very complicated geometry. So let H, H is, the, is some graph. It's deregular, M vertices, chosen uniformly at random. Okay. So I have one minute, is that okay? Yeah. Um, and now I have a smaller graph here, GN. H has M vertices. And um, let's say N, uh, GN has N vertices. So in this complicated random graph, you give me um, n vertices, whichever you want, x1, x2, etc., up to xn. And in this random geometry, I ask you what is the average distance between these vertices. Okay, so I have to look at the shortest path. Let's say between x1 and x2, I have to look at the shortest path in this graph. That's going to be this distance, and it's etc. Et for all the pairs. Okay, and the, and the theorem is that I can compute this average distance using instead of n squared distances, n distances up to a constant because this, using this graph, so I label the vertices by gn and I do the averages over edges of gn. So the same trick as I did in this room, I can do in this very complicated geometry. So we can solve, the, if you have this big random network and you want to give me a you want to compute average distances, I can do it in linear time instead of, or root the size of the input time. Now, this has all sorts of implications that I do not uh, want to, I don't have time to discuss. Uh, it solves some question that uh, Lior Silberman and I asked in 204 related to uh, Gromov's random groups. But I want to say one word about the proof. So this is one of the things which I, so, in, so this is what I like about this proof is that we have some analytic methods, and um, we have now a, very, a purely combinatorial statement. So we have a random graph, we have a concrete deterministic graph, just a formula. Let's say 100 vertices, or 1,000 vertices, and there's a statement saying for any 100 vertices in my random graph, if I look at the average over all the pairs, it's the same up to a constant factor, independent of anything, as averages over those pairs which form an edge in my smaller graph. And I have to prove this. This is a fact about random graphs. The only way I know how to do this is to introduce analysis and geometry to the problem. So the way we do it, so we, there is a structure theorem. For cones over random graphs. which is most of the work. And it says the following. Um, so look at, so H was this uniformly random graph, uni, uni, uniformly at random graph, chosen uniformly at random. So think of H as a one-dimensional simplicial complex. So I just mean I put my, the edges inside. It's not just the vertices. So the edges are actually present. Okay? Now, for every metric space, there is this notion of the Euclidean cone over the metric space. So if you have a metric space XD, the Euclidean cone let's say cone X is just defined to be a, 
zero, the closure of zero infinity or the completion of zero of the pairs of points zero infinity times x, and I'll tell you the distance in the cone between s comma x and t comma y is defined as the square root of s squared plus t squared minus two s t cosine of the minimum of pi and the distance from x to y. So what is this crazy thing? In the special case where um, x was the sphere, then this is exactly the identity that makes Rn be R plus times the sphere. So every vector you, has a direction and a length. And the, distance, the, the Euclidean distance between a vector is just this is the law of cosines. Okay? And the magic is, it's not magic, it's a case analysis, it's not a deep fact, but you have to, it's to believe it, is that actually if you treat every metric space as though it was this Euclidean law of cosines, you still get a metric. So this is still a metric for every metric space. So there is, it's elementary, it's just an exercise that everybody knows. So, so what you do is you look at, at, at H, and now you look at the cone over H. And the theorem, the structure theorem, is that if you have a random graph, then with probability tending to 1, you can partition H as A1 union A2. Not a partition. This is not disjoint. So this is, you write it as a union, but it is not disjoint. It's important. So in my graph, I have two sets which have an intersection. So let's say this and everything on the other side such that the cone over a, a, a1 embeds into L1, and the cone over A2, this is by Lipschitz distortion, which is a constant, embeds into a non-positively curved space. So the way this theorem is proved is you take a random graph, you induce from it a random two-dimensional object, and you prove a structure theorem that it's actually the union of a piece which is by Lipschitz to a subset of L1, and another piece which is a piece in which we know to have, we have all the Martingale theory. This, um, this, uh, a piece for which we know this inequality. That's non-positively non curved spaces, we can prove these inequalities for them. And therefore, any mapping into the vertices of H, you can think of it as a mapping into the cone above it, which is this two-dimensional spider web. And you use all this machinery, all these Martingale inequalities and the bigger space in order to prove something about the vertices. And in the end, the whole cone disappears. And, and when we have uh, this uh, theorem, but um, so Noga, this is a challenge. I, 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 this is a theorem about random graphs. And, and, and we somehow, uh, we, we, the only way we know how to prove this theorem about this, the vertices of a combinatorial graph is to embed it in a random two-dimensional object and use the, con the whole continuous structure uh, to prove the theorem. So, so I'll end here. I'm sorry, I'm over time. <laughs>